uh, should be a very popular topic, I would imagine. So first I'd like to introduce you to our panel while I check my stream health and then we'll get ahead, go ahead with our talk. So we'll start with Seema Ji. Please, please um, introduce yourself, Seema. Hello, good morning, everybody. I'm Seema Nair. I'm a registered holistic nutritionist. And today we will be discussing on how ways to manage hypertension, uh, the diet strategies. Um, thank you. everyone and uh, thank you dr sabam thank you sima ji for a very informative and uh, useful this you are giving us and uh, thank you thank you so much oh and uh, we are uh, sapan's parents uh, from delhi this is a uh, type of topic is uh, quite time testing and it's uh, very popular and uh, uh, the blood pressure problem is common uh, because of the lifestyle and uh, in life. Normally, we are uh, read about this topic sources uh, and uh, also talks uh, come to come across uh, uh, from different. Uh, Today's uh, chat, uh, health chat is, uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to and dispelling our ignorance. Thank you. Good morning from Canada. This is Chaya Kotnala from Toronto, Canada. And um, blood pressure is a very um, important topic. It's called silent killer. So it is really good. I'm really looking forward to learning more and how to um, improve my health and um, advise others too of uh, any benefits of whatever the talk happens today. Thank you very much. Happy Holi. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am Ashish Kothial from Toronto. And I'm here uh, to learn a few more things about uh, managing the blood pressure from uh, Chaya Ji and uh, Dr. Rawat. Um, touch wood so far, I'm away from this disease, but it's something eager to know about it and learn from uh, both experts. Thank you. Okay, I'm uh, Kasturi Venkatesh, and Chaya has already said, like, we are neighbors, and we've known each other ever since we moved uh, next to each other. Um, and uh, blood pressure is, uh, is a topic that I'm, you know, uh, I'm very much interested in. I have blood pressure and uh, very much in control, and I am in of fitness and exercise and uh, also diet but I still have blood pressure so I want to know more how to manage blood pressure but I want to know how to manage it more. Thank you Kasturiji. Kasturiji is first timer today. Uh, I think she was trying to join us on YouTube. We had a technical glitch, which is why we were 20 minutes late in starting, but I'm really glad she joined on the live chat, which is even better, I guess. So uh, let's um, uh, just to complete the introduction, I'll tell you about myself. My name is Dr. S. Rawat. And um, and, and so I did my primary education from India, my postgraduate MD in family medicine from the UK. I worked in England for 15 years before I moved to Canada about five years ago. So as a family physician, I see my speciality is engaging with patients, interpreting complex medical information to them to make it available in simple terms and promoting healthy and wise health choices. Of course, this blog is accurate for the time that it is published and scientific evidence and information does change over time and, and so would my opinions. Uh, there is an element of live chat. We are live on YouTube as well as Facebook. Uh, I would like to just remind everyone that maintaining patient confidentiality is paramount. And so if anyone has any questions, 
either uh, by typing on live chat Facebook or YouTube or on the Google Meet live chat. I would request that you ask the question in a third party, anonymous kind of way. So please don't be specific. Please don't name yourself or anyone else. Please just be very anonymous. Keep it third party, keep it anonymous. In that way, then I can answer or our, our holistic nutritionist Seema can answer those questions in a third party general kind of way, which applies to everyone. Uh, rather than being specific, because we don't want to inadvertently um, you know, disclose sensitive confidential medical information. So starting with the talk, today's topic is lifestyle and dietary management of blood pressure. This is my 32nd blog in the last, in the last 12 months. Most of my blogs have been about COVID-19. Uh, more recently, we've been doing topics like obesity, fatty liver, anti-inflammatory diet, and today um, we're doing blood pressure. So like Chaiji said, blood pressure can be described as a silent killer. It is in fact the most common primary care diagnosis that we make. And there is a strong association of cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease meaning strokes and heart attacks and uh, premature death and blood pressure. Uh, once you're above the age of 60, about one in two people will have raised blood pressure. And there is a very close correlation between blood pressure and increased mortality from diseases. In fact, just a two millimeter rise in systolic blood pressure. Now just go through a few simple definitions here. When you check your blood pressure, you generally get three numbers. You get the, the big number, the top number, the smaller number, the bottom number, and then you get a pulse rate. So the top number we call systolic, the bottom number we call diastolic, and then you have the pulse rate. Uh, when I ask my patients to monitor their blood pressure, I ask them to report all three things. I, I just realized that uh, my talk is not visible to everyone on the Google Meet. So let me go ahead and just share my screen first. It was visible to everyone on YouTube and Facebook, but not on the Meet. So let's, I've just, uh, I've just shared my screen. There we are. So every two millimeter rise in systolic blood pressure is associated with a 7% increase in mortality from ischemic heart disease and 10% from stroke. So the um, JNC7 classifies blood pressure in adults above the age of 18. Normal when it's below 120 by 80. They describe prehypertension so you, you, you would have noticed there are several conditions, pre-diabetes being one of them, where we have now started putting down as levels which used to be considered normal as pre-diabetes or pre-hypertension. So this is that kind of trend where we're trying to identify at-risk people earlier and intervene earlier. Of course, in these situations, it's probably more appropriate to intervene in the form of lifestyle management rather than medication. And I believe the same applies to pre-diabetes as well. So pre-diabetes is a level under what would have been considered the upper level of normal. So between 120 to 139 for the systolic, between 80 and 89 for the diastolic. Stage one hypertension is from 140 to 159 systolic, 90 to 99 diastolic. And stage two hypertension is above 160 for systolic and above 100 for diastolic. I'd like to add that what we describe as malignant or very dangerous hypertension is above 180 for the systolic and above 110 for the diastolic. In most cases, up to 95%, we would describe blood pressure as essential, idiopathic or primary, which means that it is something which is likely happen as you get older, the blood vessels are getting hard, harder, stiffer, the kidneys are not excreting as much salt as they used to, and it's an aging process while there will be up to 10% of cases which have secondary hypertension. This can be due to a variety of endocrine, renal, vascular causes, which we will not be going into in this blog uh, because our blog is more targeted towards lay people. It's, it's not really targeted towards physicians. How to measure blood pressure is very important. Now, first of all, I'd like to point out one thing. Increasingly, we are becoming more aware 
of two conditions. One is white coat hypertension is the other is masked hypertension. In fact, masked hypertension is a relatively new concept. Uh, and we have realized that it's very significant. In fact, it, is, it causes significant mortality and morbidity. Masked hypertension, you could say, is the opposite of white coat hypertension. White coat is when patients typically have a high blood pressure in the clinic, but a normal blood pressure at home, and masked is the opposite. These patients somehow manage to have a normal blood pressure in the clinic, but at home, their blood pressure is raised. And for this reason, now, home blood pressure monitoring is being considered as the gold standard for diagnosing and also monitoring blood pressure. Because this, in a way, uh, bypasses both white coat as well as masked hypertension. So today we will spend some time to talk about how your blood pressure needs to be measured. This website here um, gives you a list of validated blood pressure machines and they're given either a gold rating or a silver rating by this website. One machine which is a Japanese uh, company Omron is considered quite widely as a gold standard. Uh, you will see Omrons in most clinics. And uh, um, I tend to recommend Omrons to my patients as well because you really can't go wrong. All the Omrons on the, are essentially gold standard. As an example, if you really want to go for the cheapest one, you could go for a three series. Um, at Walmart, you can get this for $57.77 plus, plus, plus tax. Uh, but you can see it's a bit old. Uh, three series and you can see it's out of stock. It might not be available for very long. Mind you, it's a decent blood pressure machine for home. Uh, it's available in India as well. If you want to go for a more advanced machine for just a bit more money, you can see this is $57, this is $85. This is a series 10 that you can get for Costco for $85 plus tax. A very, very good quality blood pressure monitor. So, what steps do you need to take? Well, first of all, you need to be relaxed. Uh, you, you need to have an empty bladder. You, might, you should ensure you haven't had any tea or coffee for about 30 minutes beforehand. When you're sitting, your feet should be on the ground. You shouldn't be perched up on a bed or anything. You should be, your feet should be on the ground. Your back should be supported with the back of your chair. And you should have a table or something, or perhaps an armchair, where you can rest your arm roughly at the level of your heart. So that is how you should be. You should be in a relaxed position, feet down, back supported, arm supported on a table or armchair at the level of the heart. The cuff must be loose. A tight cuff is a common problem and it gives you false diastolic low readings. It's better to have a looser cuff than a tighter cuff. If you're in doubt, go and get, get yourself a larger cuff. Then we recommend you should take three readings, one minute apart, and note down the lowest one. The lowest one, and I tend to go by systolic, the top number, would be essentially you reading for that time. When I ask my patients to monitor their blood pressure, I ask them to monitor it twice a day. First thing in the morning is the first reading, 12 hours after that would be the second reading. So that's twice a day. And I ask them to do that for five days. I also ask them to do this alternating arms. So on the first day, if you use one arm, the next day you would do the other arm. And the day after you would do the other arm again. Of course, when I say twice a day, I mean you're taking those three readings one minute apart in the morning and then you're taking those three readings one minute apart in the evening and you note down the reading with the lowest systolic blood pressure. Then when it comes to averaging your blood pressure, uh, this is a guidance by NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence in the UK. They then ask you to discard the first day's readings. So you would discard the two readings at the very beginning you would be left with eight readings from the next four days. You would then calculate an average of those eight readings. It should be noted that if you see a consistent difference in blood pressure between the left and right side 
of more than 10 millimeters of mercury, then you should really write those readings separately and, pro and make the doctor av uh, aware of that. There are certain rare conditions uh, such as narrowing of the blood vessel of your aorta, uh, co um, coarctation of aorta, uh, subclavian artery stenosis, which can cause a difference between, significant difference between blood pressure readings left and right. So if you, if you notice that, you should make your doctor aware, aware of that. And then that's how, what I ask my patient to do. Um, twice a day, alternating day arms, blood pressure readings, five days, calculate average for last four days, i.e. eight readings, and make a doctor aware of the systolic, diastolic, and pulse averages. So what's the target of treating your blood pressure if you're treating your blood pressure? Well, the UK uh, National Institute of Clinical Excellence says that it should be well, below 140 by 90 in clinic, below 135 by 85 at home, if you're up below the age of 80, and they then become a bit more lenient for patients above the age of 80, then they say it should be 150, 90 in clinic, 145, 85 at home. However, if you have risk factors such as diabetes, kidney disease, and I would add in other things like heart disease, previous stroke, then you should really be targeting below 130 by 80. Interestingly, the American Heart Association is very influenced by the SPRINT trial, which showed a statistically significant reduction in mortality and morbidity when blood pressure was aggressively treated, although those patients did have more side effects, such as lightheadedness, dizziness, falls. And so the American Heart Association recommends a target of 130 by 80 below that for all patients. I'm sure there will be more questions about this and we will do a question answer session at the end. So, Lifestyle and diet modifications to reduce blood pressure. Now I'm sure Seema will be talking, our holistic nutritionist will be talking about a lot of these things as well. Of course, weight loss is very important, focusing mainly on waist, waist circumference reduction. We do have other topics, uh, other blogs, and other videos on obesity management, on fatty liver, anti-inflammatory diet, so I would urge you to watch those videos as well in conjunction with this. Alcohol should be limited in men to one ounce per day and for in women to half an ounce per day. That also applies to lighter, lighter weight people. Sodium salt should be restricted. Bear in mind, vast majority of the salt is in takeout food, canned food, biscuits, other kinds of things that we bring in. Very few people ever add salt to their food. Most of the salt is already in the food. Uh, the, it's found that the effect of sodium restriction tends to be greater in, in people of Africa, Arabian origin, older people, and patients who have kidney disease or metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome, you will, you may remember, is a triad of uh, you know, pre-diabetes, obesity, fatty liver, obstructive sleep ap apnea, etc. Uh, you should maintain good amounts of potassium, calcium, and magnesium. And um, you know you might want to consider a supplement which contains those. Generally, a 50 plus multivitamin would contain adequate amounts. Anyone who smokes should stop smoking. Uh, the amount of saturated fat and cholesterol should be reduced. Because you must bear in mind, blood pressure is not exactly a disease. It's a risk factor. It's a risk factor for cardiovascular disease and increased Cholesterol is also a risk factor. So you want to reduce risk factors such as um, smoking, such as high cholesterol. At least 30 minutes of daily exercise, aerobic type would be beneficial for most patients. Diet-wise, the American Heart Association promotes that we should increase consumption of fruits, vegetables, low-fat dairy products, and a DASH diet, which stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension, encourages increased fruits and vegetables, increased fish twice a day if possible, dietary insoluble fibers, whole grains, plant source proteins, and reduction in saturated fats and cholesterol. Because a lot of blood pressure can be associated with metabolic syndrome, uh, which is associated with fatty liver, obesity, I would also 
recommended reduction in processed and refined carbohydrates, particularly fructose, and some degree of time restricted eating or intermittent fasting, I'm sure would be beneficial, particularly if you do that later in the day. So having dinner as early as possible and then starting a period of time restricted feeding after that. You can drink water, you can drink uh, you know, green tea, you can drink black coffee, but try to restrict any consumption of anything else apart from those three things for a period of time. As an example, shall say, you know, after 6 p.m. or 5 p.m. till the morning. Personally, I do a modified version of this. After 5 p.m., I do not eat any carbs. I only eat um, fruit and salad after 5 p.m. until, until breakfast, um, which I'm sure has a role in cleansing your liver and reducing risk of metabolic syndrome, fatty liver, pre-diabetes, etc. Just a side note about obstructive sleep apnea. It's a very common but underdiagnosed condition. This is this is typical in people who have who are obese. Even if they're not obese, they typically have a double chin. They will typically have a big neck, a pedunculus chin, and often a chin that you will see they don't have a very defined jawline. Often they um, they have a very round face and a round jawline. And these are people who snore at night. The trouble is that they not only snore, they also stop breathing at night. So when they stop breathing, and we call those apneic episodes, during that time, the body is deprived of oxygen. The oxygen level falls. Uh, the body goes into a panic. The body thinks that there is no oxygen going around. As a reaction, it increases the blood pressure. Because if you increase blood, you will get more oxygen to the tissues. So obstetric sleep apnea is a very important, however underdiagnosed condition, which leads to raised blood pressure. Um, in fact, about half patients with blood pressure have obstetric sleep apnea, and about half patients with obstetric sleep apnea have hypertension. Um, you would think that treating sleep apnea with CPAP would logically improve the blood pressure, but it, it has not been very successful. It has been successful in, uh, with other parameters, be it the patient feeling fresher, more refreshed in the daytime, not having to have that nap in the afternoon that they used to have, not feeling excessively tired after eating food. Their, their symptoms improve, but the blood pressure typically doesn't improve as much because we suspect there are other factors such as obesity, hyperaldosteronism, increased sympathetic drive, increased activation of venin angiotensin system, which contribute to their hypertension, not just the sleep apnea on its own. Uh, but any patients and any patients who have spouses who would snore, who have borderline blood pressure, maybe they're just in that um, early pre-hypertension phase, I would recommend speak to your physician consider having a sleep study so that uh, we, we can find out if you have sleep apnea or not and you can then start working on those factors. Today's talk is primarily for lay people, it's not really for physicians. But I will quickly just talk about some salient features of pharmacological treatment. And I will talk about, although there are more, I will just talk about five commonly used drugs which are treated for blood pressure. Uh, the first is ACE inhibitors and ARBs. This is actually two classes, uh, separate classes. Uh, examples of ACE inhibitors include medicines which end with a pril, so ramipril, lisinopril, enalapril, captopril, perinopril, and ARBs are similar. Uh, they both work on the venin angiotensinogen system, which is essentially a kidney, kidney blood vessel, and overall vasculature related system. Uh, Examples of ARBs include medicine which end with that artan as an example. Losartan, candisartan, erbisartan, um, all the sartans. The, the biggest pro is they protect your kidneys. So they are for first line and preferred for patients who have diabetes and chronic kidney disease, also preferred for patients with heart disease. Con is uh, they can be a bit less effective in older people in Afro-Caribbeans because their renin angiotensinogen system becomes less, less active. Also, the prills, ACE inhibitors, can give you a dry cough in about 
uh, one in four people, while ARBs typically don't do that. The next group is calcium channel blockers. These are uh, typically medicines like amlodipine, nifedipine, lercanidipine, philodipine. One pro is that they can be used for patients with angina and heart disease, coronary artery disease. So they can double up in that sense. Uh, effective and quick acting blood pressure medicines. Uh, one con is that they typically cause swelling around the ankles. And so patients uh, who take this, particularly on the higher dose, can start getting swelling around the ankle. So often I'll have to advise them to keep their feet up, to walk around, perhaps wear stockings to reduce that. Sometimes what, what you do is actually add a diuretic, which is a third group. Diuretics are medicines which make you urinate more and they make you pass the salt, extra salt. Because as we get older, we can have a tendency of keeping the salt uh, and not excreting it in the urine. That's medicines such as indepamide, grothalidone, um, hydrochlorothiazide, bendoflumethiazide. Uh, the biggest pro is that in patients who accumulate fluid, this could be patients with venous incompetence or heart failure, for example, uh, they, they benefit more because they get less swelling with it. Um, however, one downside is that it, it can lead to dehydration because it makes you pee. And it can also cause gout because gout is often flared up by dehydration. The fourth group is something we call beta blockers. These are examples of these are bisoprolol, carbidiolol, ethanolol. Uh, the biggest uh, pro is that in patients, especially young patients or patients who may be of childbearing age, who, who could become pregnant and who may have a stress or anxiety related blood pressure problem, it can help with those patients because it slows down the heart, it reduces shaking, it can, it can help in symptoms of anxiety, stress, as well as blood pressure. However, it, uh, it, it is not first line for treatment of blood pressure because it doesn't have as good evidence for reduction of strokes when you reduce blood pressure as the others do. So it, it is preferred in certain subsets, but it is not first line. Another con is that it can reduce your exercise tolerance by limiting your heart rate so you can't exercise as much and it can also exacerbate asthma in asthmatic patients. The final group is essentially alpha blockers, uh, medicines like Tamsulosin or Flomax. Um, it's not really a blood pressure medicine, it's primarily used in males with outflow obstruction related to enlarged prostate to help them pass urine smoothly. However, it does reduce the blood pressure. Typically, I ask patients to take it at night, and but they have to be careful when they get up from bed, uh, you know, if they have to go to the bathroom, for example, because it can cause a, a more erratic and sudden drop in blood pressure. It can cause lightheadedness when you get up from standing, because it can make your blood pressure drop quite quickly. So it can cause that condition called orthostatic hypertension. Here at the end um, is my disclaimer the websites are commonly used, uh, reference websites I often ask patients to visit. Uh, and now I will hand back to Seema. Seema, the floor is all yours. So let me present my screen now. So are you able to see the screen? Yes, Seema, yes. And this, uh, okay. I can see the first screen. And so if okay. you would click on each slide individually, then we will be able to see them all. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so today the, uh, our topic of discussion is about how holistically uh, we, we can approach towards high blood pressure. So, so let's start off by uh, talking about what our heart does. Uh, I want uh, you to think uh, what a heart looks like. So uh, do you have a good picture in your mind? So basically the strength of the heart uh, 
uh, contraction when it beats, heart valve function, and the blood vessels valve, valve tension. So let's um, the the body's mechanism has uh, uh, body has a mechanism to alter or maintain uh, blood pressure, and these are these are called as baroreceptors. So the normal uh, blood pressure is the force of the blood against the of the arteries. Actually recorded in two numbers, the systolic as the heart beats, systolic as the heart re relaxes between beats. Just, uh, the diastolic number, that is the bottom number, is most important for young people. As people get older, the di diastolic lowers and the systolic becomes more important. People with older than 55 often have normal diastolic and an elevated systolic. Predicator, uh, uh, it predicts uh, one of the risks for high blood pressure. So the, uh, uh, the top number, that's the measure, the force of blood on arteries when the heart beats. That is a 120 by 180, uh, by 80. Bottom number, that is the diastolic that measures force of blood on arteries between uh, beats. So uh, normal adult falls between 90 and 120 mm of mercury uh, and normal diastolic blood pressure uh, falls between 60 and 80 millimeter of mercury. So there are three ways to measure the blood pressure. Uh, blood pressure can be measured using different methods. Uh, these are some of the methods uh, they are using. The first way you could measure your blood pressure is to use a aneroid mo monitor. Most of you have probably had a blood pressure measured this way in the past. Uh, um, uh, Android monitor has a, a dial gauge and it uh, that is ready. Uh, that's uh, the cuff is in the hand inflated by squeezing a rubber bulb, and the heart sounds and heard through a stethoscope. Nowadays, there are digital uh, blood pressure monitors. A digital monitor is easy to use and it provides your results on small screen. These types of monitors range in the price of 30 to over $100. And another blood pressure monitors on the market is the finger or wrist blood pressure monitor. These devices do not measure blood pressure very accurately. They are also extremely sensitive to the position and the body temperature and they are very extensive. Now, what, uh, what is a high blood pressure? Basically, blood pressure uh, rises and falls during the day. When it is high over time, it is called as high blood pressure. A consistent blood pressure of 140 by 90 is considered high blood pressure. Diabetes, heart disease, or you had a stroke, your blood pressure is considered high if it is over 130 by 80. So the effects of high blood pressure on your body, there's an artery damage. So un uncontrolled high blood pressure causes damage of the blood vessels, hard hardening of the arteries, buildup of plaque, and narrowing of the arteries. So effects of high blood pressure on your bo body, hardening of the arteries, stroke, heart attack, kidney damage, and blindness. So high blood pressure is associated with hardening of arteries. This causes the heart and kidneys to work harder. A blocked or ruptured blood vessel to the brain can lead to stroke. High blood pressure increases the risk of heart attacks and congestive heart failure. Thickening of the heart walls makes it difficult to pump enough blood. This causes the fluid to build up in your lungs or in your leg legs and feet. And weakened or narrowed arteries in the kidneys cause the kidneys not to work as well to remove waste products from the blood. Thickened, narrowed, or torn blood vessels in the eyes can also cause vision loss. So what are the signs and symptoms? Called as a silent killer because most of the people have no signs or symptoms. Uh, headaches, nosebleeds, and dizziness don't occur until the blood pressure is dangerously high. So many, many people uh, do not view high blood pressure as a life-threatening because it has only few symptoms. That is why it's called the silent killer. And there are usually no signs and symptoms uh, until it's, it gets to a dangerously high value. So therefore, it is very important uh, to check yourself or get it checked regularly. 
Now, some of the causes of high blood pressure, oftentimes the causes are unknown. The, then it can be narrowing of arteries, fast heart rate, kidney disease, medication, thyroid disease. So who gets high blood pressure? People who are older, people who are overweight, have members with high blood pressure, or the family has a family, if you are overweight, or a family history of high blood pressure. So how do you know if you have high blood pressure? So if your blood pressure is no, usually normal, you should have it checked at least every two years. If it is high, your doctor will want you to check it more often. Since blood pressure varies during the day and some people have higher readings when they are at doctor's office, office uh, which is called as a white coat syndrome. It is important to take at least three readings on different days at the same time of the day to diagnose the high blood pressure. So controlling your blood pressure. So, so what are the things that you can do to control your blood pressure? Lifestyle changes like healthy plan, achieving a healthy weight, exercise, physical activity, even without weight loss. So uh, controlling your blood pressure. So lifestyle changes, your alcohol, managing stress. So if, if lifestyle changes alone, uh, it may be necessary to add blood pressure medications. Now following a healthy uh, eating plan, eating more fruits, vegetables, low fat dairy foods, including whole grains, nuts, eating less fat, red meats, sweets and sugar beverages, drinking a lot of water. So research has shown that following a healthy eating plan can both prevent and lower the high blood pressure. The DASH study, that's the dietary approaches to stop hypertension showed that a diet emphasizing uh, on whole grains, fruits, vegetables, and low fat dairy products lowered high blood pressure. The diet was also low in red meat, fat, and sweets. So limiting sodium and salt. Research shows that eating less sodium and salt lowers, lowers blood pressure. Lower your sodium intake by eating out less often. Salted canned food, just than 400 milligrams per serving. Buying low or reduced sodium or no salt added foods. Using less salt when cooking of processed food. So an another study called DASH, um, sodium uh, sh showed that reducing sodium intake also lowered blood pressure. It was seen in people who consume at least uh, 1,500 milligrams per day. Most Canadians get too much sodium from processed foods, restaurant foods, and salt shaker. The current recommendation is to get less than 2,400 milligrams of sodium per day. One teaspoon of salt contains 2,400 milligrams of sodium. You can lower your sodium intake, intake by eating less restaurant food, more fresh food in place of processed food, and choosing foods in the grocery store that are low or reduced sodium, no added salt, or have less than 400 milligrams sodium per serving. In addition, try to use herbs and spices in place of salt in cooking and limit the salt in, intake at the table. Get enough potassium. Potassium helps to lower the blood pressure. Helps to balance the amount of sodium in your body, both needed for proper hydration. If you don't get enough potassium, you can accumulate too much sodium. Foods high in potassium include fruits, vegetables, dairy, and fish. Lose weight if overweight. Um, heavier people need more blood to supply nutrients to the body. Losing even 10 pounds can lower your blood pressure check with your doctor if to see if this is necessary be physically active inactivity increases your risk of being overweight heart muscles have to work harder with each contraction increasing the force on the arteries walking 30 continuous minutes a day helps to lower the blood pressure strive for 10000 steps per day around 5 miles Stop smoking. Smoking damages the blood vessels, walls, and causes early hardening of arteries. Nicotine narrows your blood vessels and forces your body to work harder. Limit alcohol. Heavy drinking, three or more drinks a day, can damage your heart muscles, cutting back 
to a moderate level of drinking can lower your blood pressure. No more than two drinks a day for men. No more than one drink for women. Managing stress. High levels of stress can temporarily cause a dramatic increase in blood pressure. Develop relaxation techniques to deal with stress. The effects of stress can usually only temporary or on your blood pressure. But if you have stress regularly, it can produce increases in blood pressure that can damage your arteries heart brain and kidneys and eye you can better cope with stress by making changes in your normal routine and developing relaxation techniques like deep breathing exercise muscle relaxation exercise meditation tai chi and yoga now let's talk about the dietary approaches to prevent hypertension the dash diet a diet promoted to prevent and control hypertension it has been shown to be effective in lowering blood pressure and blood lipid levels, which ultimately reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease, So, which is rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and contains some lean protein uh, sources like chicken, fish, and beans, limited in sugar-sweetened foods and beverages, red meat, and ad added fats. A little dash will do. DASH diet is rich in magnesium, potassium, and calcium, which are protective against high blood pressure. DASH diet is inversely associated with the risk of type 2 diabetes mellitus when combined with exercise. It can result in significant weight loss, which improves insulin sensitivity and can decrease the risk of diabetes by as much as 37%. So the DASH diet uh, doesn't list specific foods to eat. Instead, it recommends a dietary pattern that focus on the numbers of serving of different food groups. For example, grains and grain products that include at least three whole grain foods each day, around six to uh, 12 servings. Fruits, around four to six servings. Vegetables, four to six servings. Low fat or no fat dairy foods, two to four servings. Lean meats, fish or poultry, around 1.5 to 2.5 uh, servings. Nuts, seeds and legume, around three to six per week. Fats and sweets, around two to four. So this is uh, this should be more limited. Grain and brain, grain products. Grains include bread, cereal, rice, pasta. Focus on whole foods because they have more fiber and nutrients than do refined grains. Grains are naturally low in fat. Keep them this way by avoiding butter, cream, and cheese sauces. Fruits. Many fruits need like preparation to become healthy part of your meal or snack. Example of one serving include one medium fruit, half cup of fresh or frozen or canned fruit or four ounce of juice. Have a piece of fruit with meals. Then round, up, round your day with a dessert of fresh fruit stopped with low fat yogurt. Tomatoes, carrots, broccoli, sweet potatoes, greens and other veggies are full of fiber, vitamins and such minerals as potassium and magnesium. Examples of one serving include one cup raw leafy green vegetables or half a cup cut raw or cooked vegetables. Low fat or non-fat dairy like milk, yogurt, cheese and other dairy products are major sources of calcium, vitamin D and protein. So go easy on regular and even fat-free cheeses even because they are typically high in sodium. Legumes. Consume four to five times per week. Spice up salads by adding raw or unsalted dry roasted nuts or seeds such as walnuts or sunflower seeds coat chicken or fish with crushed nut mixture or seeds in them grab a handful of unsalted nuts for a snack lean meat fish and poultry choose lean varieties and aim for more than six ounces a day cutting back on your meat portion will allow room for more vegetables trim away the skin and fat Ref refrain from frying Eat uh, health, health, heart healthy fish such as salmon, herring, and tuna. Uh, with fats, Dash keeps, uh, keeps your uh, daily saturated fat to less than 6% of your total calories by limiting use of meat, butter, cheese, whole milk, cream, and eggs in your diet, along with the foods made from large solid shortenings and palm and coconut oils. Sweet. Always make sure you read the nutrition labels carefully and purchase the items with lower amounts of sugar make fruit based deserts replace sweetened tea with flavorful herbal tea drink water or milk in place of soda or juice now what are the tips uh, to cut back on sodium 
using sodium free spices or flavorings with your food instead of salt not adding salt when cooking rice pasta or hot cereal rinsing the canned foods to remove some of the sodium buying foods labeled no salt added sodium free low sodium or very low sodium 1 teaspoon of table salt contains 2325 mg of sodium so this is one of us uh, one of the uh, dash diet menu uh, what you can have for a breakfast like for example apple cinnamon cut oats one cup of cooked oat when with, with with one apple a tablespoon of peanut butter and a teaspoon of cinnamon for lunch you can have a salad with homemade dressings uh 3 cups of greens one cup of cooked quinoa one cup of cherry tomatoes cucumbers and bell peppers and for dinner a, ch a chicken stir fry with brown rice uh frozen stir fry vegetables cooked chicken um one uh, cup of low sodium soy sauce supplements that help lower hypertension so the supplements like garlic uh, may improve blood circulation support the heart and circulatory system to normalize blood pressure studies have shown garlic to significantly lower both diastolic and systolic blood pressure cocutan is the other uh, supplement that can be a powerful antioxidant that supports the cardiovascular system and provides the cellular energy research has also shown that it can de decrease the diastolic and systolic blood pressure ubiquinol is more active form of coq10 and is more absorbable than standard coq10 which may which can be more effective in replenishing uh, coq10 uh, status in older adults now omega 3 fatty acids can be also beneficial for heart health research has shown that taking fish oil can effectively blood uh effectively lower your blood pressure especially for those with high, high blood pressure or high cholesterol levels called as folate is found in green leafy vegetables citrus fruits and beans as well as fortified foods such as breads and cereal suggested uh, studies suggest that folic acid may help to lower blood pressure in both men and women is an important in regulating cell function and relaxation capability of vascular smooth muscle research has shown magnesium to help to normalize high blood pressure in unmedicated high, hypersensitive patients so if uh, if your blood pressure is still high after making lifestyle changes your doctor may decide to start you on a blood pressure medication there are many different types of medication that work in different ways you may require more than one type of to control your blood pressure diuretics helps your kidney to get rid, uh, rid of the excess sodium and water reducing blood volume often the first and the most effective medication you will be given beta blockers cause your heart to beat more slowly and less forcefully so there is less pressure on the heart and arteries ace inhibitors helps blood um, vessels relax calcium channel blockers helps to relax muscles and blood vessels so the points to remember lifestyle changes that can prevent and control high blood pressure include eating healthy emphasizing fruits and vegetable choosing and preparing foods with less salt and sodium losing weight if you are overweight increasing the physical activity avoiding alcoholic and carbonated beverages beverages so tips for accurate use so take your blood pressure at a consistent time such as in the morning and in the evening use your arm wherever you take your blood pressure note many digital monitors are meant for use only on the left arm don't measure your blood pressure immediately after you wake up in the morning wait for an hour or so if you are if you exercise after walking take a blood pressure before exercising and always use a dominant arm and make sure it uh, it is in the resting position cuff is around the bicep with a tube on the top cuff is tight enough to fit uh, one finger in between cuff and bicep press the on and off button and press start and stay relaxed so this is what the reading means right the normal should be less than 120 uh, uh, then um, for hypertension it should be in the range of 120 to 39 
and high blood pressure stage one it is in the range of 140 to 159 for the systolic and for the diastolic it should be 90 to 99 so different stages will have their specific readings so when it comes to preventing and treating high blood pressure one often overlooked strategy is managing stress if you often find yourself tense and on edge try the seven ways to reduce stress make sure that you get enough sleep Inadequate or proper quality of sleep can negatively affect your mood, mental alertness, energy levels, and physical health. Learn relaxation techniques, meditation, progressive muscle relaxation, guided imaginary deep breathing exercise, and yoga are powerful relaxation techniques and stress busters. Strengthen your social network. Connect with others by taking a class, joining an organization, or participating in a support group. Hone your time management skill. The more efficiently you can juggle at work and family demands, the lower your stress levels. Try to resolve stressful situation if you can. Don't be stressful situation fester. Hold family problem resolving session and use negotiation skills at home and at work. Nurture yourself. Treat yourself to massage. To uh, truly savor an experience. For example, eat slowly and really focus on the taste and sensation of each and every bite. Take a walk or a nap or listen to your favorite music. Ask for help. Um, don't be afraid to ask for help for your, from your spouse, friends, and neighbor. If stress and anxiety persist, talk to your doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Seema, for an excellent talk. Now, some people will notice some differences between what Seema said and what I said, but that's okay. Most patients will be able to figure out those little things. So that was that was great. I just want to make a few points um, uh, just on what Seema said. So the DASH diet that we talked about was, you know, researched about a, a, a almost a decade ago. And of course, there are many more diets. So the DASH diet is not all that different to a Mediterranean diet or to, let's say, a paleo diet. These are fairly similar diets. Uh, you know, they, all of them, they encourage more fruits and vegetables. They, they encourage more natural produce, more fish, and that kind of thing. But there are some salient features. I mean, we have to bear in mind a lot of blood pressure is associated with Metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is when you have fatty liver, uh, you have pre-diabetes or diabetes, obstructive sleep apnea, and all the things we talked about in the other blogs about obesity, fatty liver, inflammation apply. And so, the what I noticed with with dietary advice is that it's very slow to change. You know that we've been giving the same advice for decades and so although the the dash diet is there it's out there it's been researched the more a current kind of recommendations would be slightly different as an example we I certainly encourage lots of fruits but you have to be mindful with processed fruits so with with jam marmalade with juices especially if they're not if they're from concentrate if they're tinned if they're canned if they don't have much pulp then the fiber has been stripped down that will if it particularly if it has a lot of fructose it'll give a fructose rush to your liver it can cause increased triglycerides increased um, fatty liver so we have to bear those things in mind uh, grains we talk about you have to try to get as much brown grains so brown wheat brown bread brown tortilla spread brown rice if possible because again it comes down to the fiber when the fiber is there when it gets into your body it, it produces this kind of a cellulose kind of a membrane around your gut the the, the, the sugar is absorbed slowly in a manageable kind of way it doesn't cause big spice in your sugar but when you strip away the the fiber then 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 you get quick spikes in sugar and so uh, 
I think we need to bear th those things in mind as well. Generally speaking, anything which is refined, processed, is living inside a cupboard, in a can, or in a freezer, you have to be mindful of those things and try to maximize natural foods, natural vegetables, cruciferous vegetables, you know, fish, and, and, and those kinds of things on your diet. So just a little, um, let's say addendum to the DASH diet. Don't take it exactly as it says on the label. I think uh, with more modern kind of research, we are starting to work in, in a bit, we are starting to see the downsides of over processing and refinement of foods and how it can affect uh, the sugars and, and liver as well. So let's, let's um, open up for questions and answers. Any quick um, first reactions? Uh, you, can, you know, I'll let you decide your turns in your own, uh, or maybe I can, I, can, I can ask. Let me ask my parents first for, for their comments and uh, qu any questions that they have. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Sapan. My question is, uh, can you repeat the uh, uh, procedure to uh, measure the, uh, the, the blood pressure twice in a day? Yes, so there was a bit difference between what Seema said and what I said. Uh, yes, Seema said that wait for one hour after getting up. I said, I said, take it straight away when you get up. Essentially what happens is your blood pressure is highest in the morning. In fact, the blood pressure is highest around five o'clock or four o'clock in the morning because our, we start getting spurts of steroid and in children growth hormone, those, those spurts are taking place. And that's why when, when I, I work in emergency room, uh, we used to get the maximum cases of heart attack and heart failure early in the morning because of the rise in blood pressure at that time. And so I like to, I measure that, which is why I recommend straight away when you wake up because I don't want to miss that. Uh, spike in blood pressure. Uh, while some people will say you want to be as relaxed as possible, that's why you should wait a bit longer. But I feel that, 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 that you're giving more chance for masking the blood pressure then. You're getting more chance of missing it when it is high. So that's why I recommend first thing in the morning and then 12 hours after that. So if, you may, if you're wake, measuring seven o'clock in the morning, then you measure seven o'clock in the evening as well. And then the process of measuring blood pressure, I will just repeat for everyone. Um, you know, you have to be very well relaxed, make sure your bladder is empty, make sure you haven't had any tea or coffee for about 30 minutes. You're in a relaxed state of mind, you have been rushing around, you just didn't, you didn't just rush back from work or something. You keep your feet on the ground, keep your back supported, keep your arm at a, on a table or armchair, and then you put a nice loose fitting cuff around. Like Seema said, you should be able to fit one finger between your cuff and your arm, so you shouldn't be too tight. Then you do three readings, uh, one minute apart. As you must say dominant arm, I tend to say dominant arm, you can say do on the first day, two readings, and the next day I do the left arm. And then the, on the, the third day I do the right arm, fourth day left arm, and then again right arm. Discard the first day's readings, and do calculate an average of systolic, diastolic, and pulse of the next four days readings. So that would be average of those eight readings that you have. The reading that you note down after doing that three times, is the best systolic reading out of those three. The, out of the big number at the top, the best one out of those three is the one that you record. Second question, uh, if we take in the morning, if we take uh, three, three measurements, uh, one minute apart, then uh, what happens is the first uh, me measurement is, uh, first reading is uh, quite high, the second is lower, and the third is lowest. Yes, that is typically <laughs> so what happens. That's typically what happens. And that is the whole idea of checking it three times. Because, uh, so that's why then you will be you noting down the third one, the, the best one, the lowest one. Thank you so much for very useful information. Thank you, Dr. Thank Sarwan. You. Thank Let's you. move on to Ashish for, <laughs> Mommy, do you have any questions about blood pressure management? Okay, let's move to Ashish for any questions or any comments. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rawat. Thank you, Seema Ji. Uh, very informative. Um, I have, uh, you know, three um, questions or I would like to have uh, 
your expertise or opinion on those one. Uh, the first one is, um, let's say, when my parents, they go to India, the doctors there say, hey, your blood pressure is normal. Uh, you don't need any medication. And then when they come here, then doctors here, they say, no, 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 the criteria has changed. It's no more adjustment for older people. And you need uh, to be cautious. Uh, you are in that range. So one is that one. Uh, second is, is it true that um, the lower, what you call systolic, uh, is more dangerous than the upper one? Uh, that's, that's the second one. And third one, I, will, I would like to have you know, some information on when we speak about blood pressure management, we always think about high blood pressure. But I know someone who has, who's young, younger and always had low blood pressure. There, I know so many people who have low blood pressure and they go to clinic and they say nothing, you eat uh, sugary food, uh, caffeine, but then as people, they grow older, then there are chances of getting diabetic and other things. So any suggestion for the people who have low blood pressure? Thank you. Okay, let's do those questions one at a time. The first one was about blood pressure targets in old, particularly in older people. So uh, the American Heart Association is very much influenced by the SPRINT study. In the, the SPRINT study was about 10,000 people over about three and a half years. It had to be stopped early because it showed statistically significant reduction in uh, strokes and heart attacks in patients who were treated more aggressively. And this included older patients as well. So they were all treated at a target. There was one group treated at a target of below 130 systolic and the other group was below 140 systolic. And so, um, however, as I said in the presentation, other guidances don't necessarily take that into account. For example, NICE from the UK does not advocate a very stringent blood pressure target. They say 150 by 90 for 80 plus, for example. And so not everyone is in, on board with that. I think my personal view is that it depends not upon age, it depends upon the, uh, the fitness of the person. You know, I, I get to see very fit 85 year olds and I get to see very unfit 60 year olds. Uh, so if you have a 60 year old who is, who's got, let's say pre dementia and is in a nursing home, clearly you would be a bit more lenient with that blood pressure target because Otherwise, you will end up causing dehydration, falls, you could cause a hip fracture and you could cause more harm than good. But if you have a very fit 85 year old who's doing all their activities of daily living by themselves, then you would you may well be feel confident to treat them more aggressively. Bear in mind, of course, treating aggressively does cause more side effects. So in the sprint study as well, those who were treated aggressively did get more falls, they got more lightheadedness, dizziness. And so it really depends upon the fitness of the person as to how aggressive you can be with lowering the blood pressure. But there is no doubt that uh, aggressive lowering blood pressure will reduce heart attack and, uh, and stroke risk. Your second question, Ashish, was about, there, there was one third question about low blood pressure. What was your second question, Ashish? Second is, um, I have read and uh, you know, they say that the lower range, which is uh, systolic, yes, yes. is uh, more critical to observe rather than worrying about upper range. Is it true? No, no. Th that used to be what we thought in the past, but now that has been replaced by systolic. So systolic, the top bigger number is more important. The next important thing is what's called the pulse pressure, which means the difference between the top number and the bottom number. If there is a higher difference between the top and the bottom, and that happens more with what we describe as isolated systolic hypertension, where the top number goes up, then that's a problem because that's causing a lot of variation in blood pressure. And then the diastolic is the one we actually worry least about now among those three scenarios. Yeah. And the third question with low blood pressure, and that's not, uh, yeah, low blood pressure really um, is something that the doctor, a physician would have to investigate. A lot of things like, um, being anemic, for example, having certain types of vitamin deficiencies, but also having certain tendencies. Some people have uh, a tendency towards their vagus nerve becoming hyperstimulated, which means when they hear some bad news or they've been standing at a bus stop and it's hot for 30 minutes, 
you know, they start getting lightheaded and they get a low blood pressure attack. Those patients often have to just lie down and bring their feet up. Or this can also happen when they're getting a vaccine or they're getting an injection or something like that. A lot of people faint because of low blood pressure attacks in those situations. Those people just have to lie down, bring their head down and bring their feet up so that they can get blood circulation into their brain. And But it's certainly reasonable for those patients to go see their doctors, make sure they don't have some kind of deficiencies in iron or deficiencies in other things, which can be causing that. And you're right, treating it with extra salt or extra sugar can be kind of... Uh, can be kind of self-defeating because in, you might help it in the short term but you may make other problems worse in the longer term and so it's kind of also comes down to how symptomatic you are and there are other conditions there's one condition called POTS which is paroxysmal um, uh, tachycardia and, and, and there are other conditions which can also uh, mimic this condition so it's a bit of a complex medical condition which has to be investigated thoroughly the, the, the low blood pressure aspect thank you Thanks, Ashish. Let's move on to Kasturi Ji, who's a first timer. Do you have uh, just a reminder because you're a first timer? Any questions, please? Uh, not specific to any person or yourself or anything. Just if you just make the questions completely anonymous and general, and we will answer them in an anonymous yeah. third party general kind of way. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Your presentations were great. Uh, I wish you could uh, share your uh, screens with us. Um, the reason I'm asking is I'm in the market for a new blood pressure monitor uh, and your uh, the link, I couldn't get the link uh, from the, the thing. So if, if you can share that, that that will um, that will help. And Simaji, your uh, your presentation also, um, you know, I mean, I, I am following a lot of the diet uh, uh, recommendations you gave, but there's always room for improvement. Um, my other question is, um, did it have any blood pressure um, elevation or decrease? Like, you know, humidity sometimes causes a heavy head or a headache. So does that elevate the blood pressure in any way? Like today, like the, you know, the overcast sky and something like that. Mm, I would say there's a few competing kind of situations which can happen. If it's humid, then you will sweat more. If you sweat more, then you will lose salt. So that should, in fact, reduce your blood pressure. But however, pressure. Yeah, however if you become stressed because of it, then you, the amount of uh, cortisol, hormone, epinephrine, adrenaline in your bloodstream could go up and then that would increase the stroke volume of your heart and then your blood pressure would go up. So it also depends on how it affects you psychologically as well, not, not just um, yeah. through your skin. Regarding the blood pressure machines, um, the presentation that I was sharing was my blog. I will share my blog link, it is there for everyone to see. So th that contains the links okay. for all the blood pressure machines. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you talked about pulse pl pressure towards the end. Can you kind of give me a few more details of the pulse uh, pulse readings mm -hmm. and how it relates to the systolic? And yeah, I, 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 rather than pulse pressure, are you talking about pulse rate? The third reading. The third reading, right. Yes, the third reading is a pulse rate. Pulse pressure is different. Plus, pulse pressure is a difference between the first two readings, the systolic and the diastolic. That is pulse pressure. Uh, mm -hmm. The pulse rate is the third reading, which is the how fast the pulse is racing at. And so, uh, depending on whom you listen to, I, I used to always consider a rate between 60 and 90 to be the normal. Now, according to Medscape, 60 to 100 is the normal. So below 60 would be a slow pulse rate. Saying that, my heart rate tends to be between 50 and 60. Uh, you know, but and that's often a real, real uh, you know, I don't want to call myself fit, but yeah, I do play about an hour of tennis every day. So that's probably why my pulse rate is slow. And so often uh, people who are athletic will often have a slower pulse rate. So you could almost call the pulse at between 50 to 100. However, if your resting okay. pulse rate is on the faster side, that is generally a sign of either uh, deconditioning, which means you're not very fit, that's why your heart mm -hmm. is generally beating at a faster pace, even within that normal range. Uh, the second thing, it can be a sign of a certain medical conditions. 
So when, when we talked about the secondary causes of blood pressure, particularly if you're getting above 100 consistently, you know, cardiac rhythm problems, thyroid problems, hormonal problems, uh, endocrine problems, they can also cause that kind of fluctuation in heart rate. So th that would be something you, you may need testing with an EKG or 48 hours halter. You may need to see your doctor. Uh, someone may need to see a doctor about uh, the heart rate consistently being out. But within the no normal range, uh, uh, if it's on the lower side, say between 50 to 70, generally a sign of fitness. Also, that can be affected by your blood pressure, uh, blood pressure medication. So if you're taking a, if someone takes a blood pressure medicine such as a beta blocker, you know, bisoprolol, etanolol, that will naturally reduce the heart rate. And, um, but if the pulse tends to be on the higher end of normal range, let's say between 70 and 100, then that is generally a sign of deconditioning. That person needs more exercise, needs to become more fit, likely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So do you recommend taking the medication first thing in the morning, like after you take your first reading? Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. And that's something we didn't cover. Uh, everyone does it differently. Typically, if I give someone one blood pressure tablet, unless it's a diuretic, I ask them to take it in the evening. The reason for that is that the highest blood pressure is for, is very early in the morning, starting at 4, 4 a.m., 5 a.m., and that will be more affected by your evening dose of blood pressure tablet, okay. not the morning dose. Okay. So if it, unless it's a diuretic, of course, because if you take a diuretic, in the evening, you'll end up having to go to the bathroom at night. So any diuretic, yeah, I usually take first to. thing in the morning. If it's just one blood pressure, but not a diuretic, I usually ask it them in the morning. Often, when there are two blood pressure tablets, one of them will generally be a diuretic. So I will make the, the diuretic to be taken in the morning and the other tablet to be taken in the evening. And if you end up with three or four tablets, I usually split them 12 hours apart. I will usually make two of them uh, typically a diuretic, maybe with a calcium channel blocker in the morning. And typically the beta blockers I like to use in the evening as well, because beta blockers are the ones which can slow your heart rate down. They can reduce your exercise tolerance, but they can also reduce anxiety. And so patients who have an anxious dep deposition and who have trouble with sleeping, for example, they may actually benefit from a beta blocker more in the evening. So I tend to space them out 12 hours apart in two different batches, generally speaking. Okay, so the, uh, the calcium, whatever you said, the calcium inhibitor or whatever, that is in the morning, you're saying? Generally speaking, I will give channel, channel uh, calcium channel blockers and diuretics in the morning. Okay. I will typically give beta blockers, uh, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, as well in the evening. And if a, a male patient with an enlarged prostate is taking tamsulosin, which is the alpha blocker, that is typically taken at night before they go to bed. Okay, got it. Great. So, uh, also, yes. go ahead. Uh, can you quickly talk about that intermittent fasting? It's very interesting because my daughter is doing it, and boy, she looks amazing after she's uh, she's been doing it, and uh, you know, she is so fit and so looks so good and yes, sure. I don't know at my age is it a good thing to try like I'm not sure <laughs> sure so um, let me first answer that question and then I'll open it to Seema to answer about intermittent fasting now intermittent fasting right. know, it can be described as a fad kind of diet uh, but you don't have to necessarily consider uh, do intermittent fasting exactly as they recommend. I, I believe not so much in intermittent fasting, but more so in what you can describe as time time restricted eating. So yeah. in, in, intermittent fasting has an element of you know a calorie restriction as well. I don't necessarily believe you have to. Everyone has to do that. But some element of time restricted eating, I'm I think helps. A lot of people find it much easier to skip breakfast and eat later, like have a brunch. I don't recommend that I, uh, from a metabolic point of view, because what you want to do is you want to take your calories in and then you want to burn those calories. And at a time when you're not burning calories, you want to eat less food because if you eat food at that time, it will go straight, straight into your liver, into your storage, into your glycogen. 
And so the time restricted eating should really be later in the day, not earlier in the day. And that's why the British people said, you know, eat breakfast like a king and you should have dinner like a pauper, like a beggar. And I believe in that. So personally, I try, uh, I do a modified version of time restricted eating. So I don't eat any carbs after 5 p.m., but I do eat fruits and salad after 5 p.m. And some people who want, and I allow myself a black, uh, black coffee and green tea as well during that period. Uh, of course, people will have different situations and they might want to do a complete water fast uh, after evening time. You know, it depends on your life situation, depends on your health conditions and all that. How I, I believe it works is it cleanses your liver. If, if your glycogen, which is sugar storage in the liver, becomes depleted during that period of fasting, it gives you that reboot. It gives the liver that reboot to start again. Uh, but if you keep feeding sugar to yourself all the time, your insulin is always spiking, your body starts developing that insulin resistance and that inflammation and fat triglyceride buildup, fatty liver in the liver starts uh, starts accumulating. It doesn't get any chance to clean because as we talked in our liver uh, talk, in our fatty liver talk, the accumulation of fat in the liver is a, is a process of not just increased fructose, uh, you know, corn syrup, fructose and, and triglycerides, triglycerides and fat, but also an element of cleaning, of not getting time to cleanse itself. And we have become a very snacking culture uh, kind of society where all the time we believe something has to be kept next to us, even watching TV or doing whatever. We're always putting something in our mouths, even watching around, uh, you know, we, we are doing something. Uh, even on a bus stop, you see people swigging Coke and eating uh, chips. Uh, you, you don't have to always be putting something in your mouth. You have to give your liver some some rest. And I feel that's where the theory of uh, time restricted eating helps. I've actually got a comment here from Pooja Ji. Thanks, Pooja Ji. Um, let me read this comment. She says that she has been following a time restricted eating plan. And she says it's been amazing for her blood work. And, and, uh, Oh, Pooja Ji's blood work is as good as good as it as it gets. And you know, I will, at the risk of divulging her confidential information, I will tell her she's she's just a perfect patient. So, uh, Pooja Ji, you're doing excellent. We're all very proud of you. Uh, and and she says it works for her. So I'm sure it works for a lot of other, a lot of other people as well. So Seema Ji, um, would you be uh, kind enough to just give us your opinion about intermittent fasting or time restricted eating? Yeah. So the thing is, there are different types of intermittent fasting, right? So one is the 16-8. Uh, that is the uh, most recently people follow the 16-8. So they fast uh, in the, uh, they have their lunch or the first meal around 12 uh, p.m. in the afternoon. Then later they have it around 4 p.m. And then they fast the whole day, right? So this is 16-8 diet. Some people are able to follow. See, everybody is different. So everybody ha can follow different types of... Inter there are six intermittent fasting. 16-8, uh, 5-2. So the, they uh, eat for... They fast for two days. They eat for five days. Uh, alternate day fasting is there. Some people do that. And some... And the benefits... Uh, uh, within intermittent fasting, the benefits are always good, right? So you are giving your body to rest. So your organs can uh, detoxify themselves uh, when you're not eating anything, right? So that is one thing. So it's up to you, like, for example, uh, uh, for uh, certain age groups, they, ca they can follow that. Certain age groups, they cannot, right? Especially if somebody is on a medication and all, then that becomes a problem, right? Because you have to uh, maintain the blood sugar levels and all. So you need to have eat something during specific time, you know? So that is when this problem comes. But slowly you can switch. So you can modify that. It's not that you have to follow the same intermittent uh, timings, but you can modify according to your health. Do you have any? Yeah, thank you. That, that was very useful. Yeah. I, I think I'll stick to the restricted diet <laughs> pattern. <laughs> <laughs> You know, um, Kasturiji, I really, my feeling after uh, writing all these blogs and looking into these things is that uh, even after a certain time, say 5 p.m., if you can just restrict yourself to fiber, natural fiber containing foods like fruits, 
and vegetables or or salads and uh, green tea and black coffee if you can restrict yourself to those things even that will be beneficial mm. if you can okay. not have white rice white bread uh, white chapatis or any ice creams or things which contain preservative like uh, high fructose corn syrup if if you can even you know uh, let's not even talk about uh, jalebi and gulab jamun and rasgulla and all that so if you can restrict yourself to that kind of a very natural food selection after a certain time i'm sure even that will give uh, your body your liver that rest that it needs to reboot for the next day ashish you have any some okay. comments no nothing nothing i was just saying ke agar jalebi gulab jamun nahi khayenge to neend nahi aayegi sapne mein bhi dikhenge then then the cortisol will be always high in the sleep no <laughs> <laughs> oh, nothing no. nothing pa- no. daddy uh, uh, can you give us some kind of um, connection dr safa <laughs> Daddy, give us some kind of um, you know background about fasting, even for, perhaps even from a cultural perspective. You know, why do you think fasting has been introduced for in many cultures? Do you, do you think it might be because of uh, the health benefits, perhaps? I did not pay attention. Anyway, I have I have a question. The confusion is um, I have heard many doctors. they tell us uh, that uh, in the evening don't eat fruit after 6 o'clock or 5 o'clock after 5 after 5 and it was in uh, us when we were visiting our son there another son so his doctor was telling and uh, he was conveying that to us that don't eat uh, fruit after 6 after 5 o'clock after 5 <laughs> in the evening we should not eat fruits So that's confusing yeah so <laughs> that is that comes down to how strict you're going to be puja ji says happy holi to everyone and happy holi to you as well puja ji uh, so uh, it depends on how strict you are because strictly speaking fruit is fructose now it is a very good form of fructose it contains fiber it contains antioxidants vitamin c it can quercetin it contains so many good things so if someone is a poorly controlled diabetic for example and wants to do this Then, then it might be reasonable for that person, but for most people, that is probably getting too strict on the intermittent fasting scale. So, f- th- for that reason, I allow myself fruit for sure because I want all those antioxidants, vitamins, fiber, and all the uh, uh, other flavonoids and all the other goodness of that fruit. Uh, certainly, uh, agree if that applies to processed fruit, so jam, marmalade, juice. without pulp certainly agree with that um if you are doing some form of time restricted uh fasting then you should certainly uh, uh, avoid processed fruits or canned fruits but natural fruits personally i am quite happy with but if someone is on another spectrum where they have metabolic syndrome they have health conditions they may want to be more strict and that is completely reasonable as well So Daddy, where but, can uh, I find your blog? Where can I find your blog, Dr. Rawat? I will send it to you, Kasturi ji. I'll put it on the WhatsApp. I'll put it on WhatsApp. You'll put it. Yes. Okay. You have my well. Chaya knows. Chaya ji knows my um, WhatsApp address and all that. Perfect. So she she can forward it, or I can. Sounds good. I, Seema I Seema can, has a has yeah. something to add. Seema, go ahead. You're muted right Espe- now. Especially yeah. with fruits and all, right? also based on the glycemic index of the fruit like if you have a health condition and if you want uh, like for example if you are uh, working towards improving our blood sugar levels and all so you have to make sure your uh, glycemic index for the f- fruit uh, you have to do a research on that like some certain f- uh, fruits like papaya and all you can eat it anytime it doesn't increase your blood sugar levels and it is safe to eat it at in, in the evening also after your meals you can have papaya you don't want to eat that and then go and sleep not like you you can do your own research to find out which are the high glycemic f- foods and you you can avoid those foods fruits the highest one is actually banana 
the most banana, sugar yes. banana the banana is the most unfruit like fruit in fact we should not consider it a fruit <laughs> but the raw, raw banana is always good raw banana cooking with raw banana making something with raw banana it has a good fiber especially the skin and all it helps with many health conditions raw banana so you can add raw banana in your diet like for cooking something and then uh, dr rawat uh, then um, health experts they say that banana is high in potassium which is good for health uh, for your heart also that's correct and blood pressure as well okay. so potassium yeah. magnesium calcium these three uh, trace minerals are good for your to reduce blood pressure as well yes even i know a lot of uh, bodybuilders they uh, cut down on their carbs and they went on uh, sweet potatoes and uh, bananas on the uh, because it's carb and uh, other nutrients also oh yes and you will see a lot of these tennis players during the break they're eating a banana you know typically rafael nadal he eats half a banana <laughs> so uh, because it contains potassium and those uh, athletes are sweating and when you yes. when you sweat you lose your salts you lose sodium yes. potassium and so they need to replace that yeah especially coconut water and bananas that is what they say right once you sweat it's better to have that coconut water and bananas i've got a comment here from um, ankita and prakash uh, saying good discussion thank you very much for your feedback please share widely do we have any more questions or any closing comments just uh, uh seema ji you mentioned something about coconut water mm -hmm. so you know there there are different opinions some people they say that the coconut water the ripe coconut water or what we get in grocery is not good you need to buy raw yes. coconut and you because the thing is during the processing we don't know what all they add that is the only only thing in that right and some people may add added sugars we don't want that added sugars in the coconut it is better to But buy the raw one if you can it's always good like some stores they carry the uh, i think costco also carries some from thailand the yeah. coconut yes now is there a difference between a ripe you know when the coconut is ripe it's brown yes and the water inside that one and then the green coconut uh, water is there any difference or both of them are the same i think the sugar sugar level will be much more concentrated compared to the raw one yeah it will be much more sweeter because and other in most of most of our south indian cooking we use coconut water to ferment things so it's always we use the coconut which is the brown one because that is what the sugar is there that ferments that uh, batter so that is what i have seen <laughs> yeah thank you thank you great so that was a, a, a great discussion um i think we we are done with questions any uh, thank you kasturi ji for joining us so i'm going to just um sign off i just say some passing comments uh thank you to pooja ji uh, ankita prakash for your comments thank you uh, just like I, i want to end on that topic about we were just talking about the coconut water and we were talking about a pure coconut uh, versus something which is canned which may have preservatives and this is th this really is an underlying theme it's very important for us to appreciate that there is a difference in food when it is in its natural form versus when it has been refined processed produced at an industrial scale it it changes the dynamics of that food the natural food contains its natural antioxidants flavonoids its natural um, vitamins and fiber fiber is very important you when you go through a processing process a lot of that fiber is stripped away from it what that does is is that uh, you know the fiber inside your gut produces this kind of a membranous layer which slows down absorption of sugar and also has other beneficial effects it also helps in uh, delaying absorption the absorption takes place lower down in your gut so for example instead of something which is uh, would be absorbed in the duodenum uh, refined 
would be uh, absorbed in the jejunum, unrefined with fiber in it. That then also contributes to your microbiome, which is a natural, healthy bacteria which live in your gut, help with your digestion. This is a very new and evolving topic now in diet and nutrition research, your natural microbiome. And so it's very important for us to realize and in our previous blogs on obesity, fatty liver, it's uh, anti-inflammatory diet, we have talked about how uh, it is important that we have as much natural food as possible. So the paleo diet, for example, is an example of that. Also, uh, Mediterranean diet, DASH diet, all these are examples of this. Uh, because every time you pull something out of the freezer or open a can, put some, take out of a biscuit or a cracker or something out of the shelf, which has a very long shelf life, just remind yourself, uh, are there some alternatives to that? You know, could you be just having a celery stick with hummus instead of having that cracker? I think that's a very, if that is a very simple change we can make to our lifestyles, uh, be it cooking, be it um, even snacking, then uh, a lot of people would find that their general health improves. And so weight loss isn't just about um, you know looking good, it's also about feeling good, it's about being, being healthier. And the, the journey we're all on here is a journey of improving health, uh, overall health. So I'd like to thank everyone for their contributions. And we'll meet again next Sunday at 10 o'clock. Thank you, Ashish. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Seema. Thank you, Sarah. Thank, thank you, Seema. Thank you, Seema.